Welcome to this worship service honoring and celebrating the life of our sister, Sherry Rachel. My name is Pastor Heidi Torgerson, and I have the privilege of serving as lead pastor here at Grace. And it's on behalf of this entire congregation that we extend our warmest welcome to you in the name of Christ. I would like to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on our live stream today. We know that there are a number of people who wished that they could be here in body, and we are grateful that you're able to join us in spirit through that online means. I just want to acknowledge that whenever we gather in this worship space for a memorial service, that we come from all kinds of different backgrounds and traditions and experiences. And so as we begin, I just want to say that whoever you are, whatever your background, wherever you come from, please be at home and at ease in this space. You already belong here. I'll invite us to rise in body or in spirit as we begin. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation, who comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation that we ourselves have received from God. Amen. We sing together our gathering hymn.
invite you to join me in the thanksgiving for baptism. All who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In her baptism, Sherry was clothed with Christ. In the day of Christ's coming, she shall be clothed with glory. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. We glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. We praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. We worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated as we sing together our hymn of praise, which you will find in the red books in front of you. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Sherry. We thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all of your saints. 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Harry Wozniak and Marian Hines to join Kimberly up here with us as we receive some remembrances of Sherry's life.
Sherry Rachel changed my life. I first met Sherry when my oldest son started kindergarten at Garfield School. Sherry didn't have an aide that year, and she asked if I would volunteer in her classroom for a few hours every week. Specifically, I'd play board games with small groups of kids, which would give her the opportunity to conduct other small group activities. I loved it. I enjoyed working with the students, and it was interesting to watch this marvelous teacher in action. As that school year was ending, Sherry told me that the district would be hiring an instructional aide for her classroom next year. Would I be interested in applying? I absolutely would, and I got the job. In total, I worked with Sherry for over 13 years, and I also had two more children. I respected her philosophy, I admired how she got it all done, and it was all done with love, caring, kindness, and knowledge. Sherry and I became more than co-workers, we became friends. I cared for her so much that I asked her to be the godmother for my youngest son. Then in 2002, Sherry retired. I was happy for her, sad for me. I was asked to speak at a retirement dinner, and I wrote my speech as a poem, talking about field trips and holiday events, class plays like the Three Piggy Opera, with Sherry accompanying the student singers on piano. Post-retirement, our friendship continued with meals at Panera and other places where we could talk for a few hours, and they wouldn't kick us out. <laughs> we shared family news, talked about books we'd read, as well as our travels, and always Garfield School. Our memories were of fun and great times with wonderful students and staff. We also made phone calls, wrote cards and notes, and eventually emails. Since I live as well as work in Forest Park, I see former students and or parents very often. They'd always ask me about Mrs. Rachel, and they would tell me to give her their regards. Many times they'd share favorite memories of our class. And let me tell you, Mrs. Rachel was loved. I enjoyed sharing these messages with her, and she would want to know what these kids, who are now adults, were doing. I also received just one text from Sherry, which she sent to me this past June on my retirement day after 36 years at Garfield. She said congrats and thanked me for all I'd done for her. It meant so much for me to get that message on that day. But that was Sherry, so thoughtful. I have lost a wonderful friend, but I've been so blessed to have had Sherry in my life. Grace and mercy and peace to all of us here and those who are watching as well as we celebrate our beautiful Sherry and her entrance into her heavenly home. When Michelle asked me to consider speaking today, I immediately wanted to say, ah, no, thank you. Sherry and I had had the discussions about this over the years, and you know, the older we got, the more we talked about things like funerals and things like that, and so we both agreed that there was no way that either of us would be able to do this in a setting like this. So remembering those conversations, I asked Michelle, did your mother ask you to do this? And she said no. So I had a little chat with Sherry about this, as I have done ever since, always. She told me to go ahead, but absolutely not to tell any of our secrets. And she would be listening. So when I speak about Sherry, I'm speaking for all of us who are here and who are part of her circle of life. I know that every one of us has our own special memories of her, and all of us will miss her in our own ways. Her family as wife, mom, mother-in-law, grandma, sister, in-laws, friends, college friends, teaching friends, students that she had in the past, church friends, choir friends, lifetime buddy friends, neighbors, and more. And all of us knew her to be a beautiful person, inside and out, faithful and full of faith, loyal, loving, supportive, giving, 
fun, brave, and courageous, especially these last months of her life. She fought so hard through all the ups and downs of these months, days of hope and then days of pain and despair until finally God said, it's enough, Sherry. No more suffering for her, and we are all thankful to God for that. But now sadness and loss for those of us left behind. As someone wrote on the website for the funeral home, as much of a family person Sherry was, she still had room for her friends. She saw what you needed before you even knew it. She had a generous heart, big enough to go around, and every friend felt like her best friend. Sherry had many things in common with lots of us here. It would be interesting to have our notes share and share our favorite memories, but permit me just to share a few of those about our lifelong friendship. We met at Concordia River Forest, and we looked somewhat alike. We shared each other's clothes, and sometimes people would get us mixed up and confused, and they'd call me Sherry, and they'd call her Marion. And even at our 50th reunion, one of um, our house mothers said to me, hi, Sherry, how are you? Oh, no, you're not Sherry, <laughs> you're Marion. And we just loved that. And in the years, often we would dress alike without even thinking about it or planning for it. We had the same color sweater, the same color shirt, whatever. And we both had a passionate love for potato chips. <laughs> Our favorite food in the whole world. We even, even shared a boyfriend or two along the way. <laughs> and those are some of the secrets that I'm not supposed to talk about. As graduation loomed ahead, we both wanted to go and be placed in New York, and we requested that on, on the part of the placement officer. Well, one of us got New York, and the other got Louisville, and the rest is history, as they say. It was truly a God thing, and Sherry got the love of her life, Bill, and I developed a southern accent. As the years passed, as they do, there were weddings, and then children, and then second careers, and then husbands who had so many things in common, which was a miracle in itself, and then sons-in-laws, including two falconing boys that our family had known from the time that they were almost born, and our children had been friends when they lived in Hales Corners, and we were friends with the parents as well. And here now, two families that we love so much were united, which was just great. And then grandchildren came, and there couldn't have been a prouder grandma in the world than Sherry was of her grandchildren. We enjoyed so many times together, Ravinia, Grace Cantadas, holiday dinners in Manhattans, and potato chips. But the most important thing we had in common was our faith in our Savior. Friends who have Jesus at the center of their relationship truly are friends forever. What a joy it has been over 60 years to have a friend who loved Jesus and to know how he loved her and had his loving arms around her and that she is now with him in perfect peace. There's a song that we both loved, and it expresses these thoughts perfectly. It was, it's a song by Michael W. Smith, and it's called Friends Are Friends Forever. Packing up the dreams God planted in the fertile soil of you, I can't believe the hopes he's granted means a chapter of your life is through. But we'll keep you close in all ways. It won't even seem like you're gone because our hearts in big and small ways will keep the love that keeps us strong. And friends are friends forever, if the Lord's the Lord of them. And a friend will not say never, because the welcome will not end. Though it's hard to let you go in the Father's hands, we know that the lifetime's not too long to live as friends. Today we celebrate all the ways that Jerry was a blessing to each of us. And we give thanks for having her to know and to love and to be loved by her. And praise be to God for that.
Our mother came into this world early as a preemie, and it feels like she left it early too. 80 years of Sharon Lee Kirshner Rachel, wife, mom, grandma, daughter, sister, aunt, friend, teacher, is not enough. We all want more, but today we celebrate the grace of what we had. Mom was uncomplicated. That does not mean simple. Her faith, strength, and intelligence allowed her to uncomplicate life's most difficult moments and relish its most daily. She did this by being rooted in love, love of God, love of Bill, love of family, love of friends, love of students, and even her love of her grand dogs. And she didn't even like dogs. <laughs> Most of us here know the beauty of our parents' 57 years of marriage. Part of that beauty was the balance between my father's complicated nature and my mother's ability to unravel his complexities to his vastly loving core. He credits her with teaching him to love. I also think to this day, he is impressed with himself that he married Sherry Kirshner, the gorgeous, tall, brown-haired, hazel-eyed woman he vividly remembers seeing for the first time on campus. The woman who finally said yes on the third proposal <laughs> once he explained that after this attempt, he was going to buy a car. <laughs> the woman who absorbed New York with him in their first years of marriage in Bayside, Queens. The woman who support him through and typed his dissertation. The woman who raised and built a family with him that reflects their committed love for one another. The woman who lined up his daughters to kiss his stoic father goodbye at the end of each Sunday meal. The woman who could take what little money they had early on and stretch it to create a home that was never in want. The woman whom he made sure had a big obituary in the Tribune because he said people and teachers like her deserve to be known. Teachers like her were rare during her career and sadly even more rare now. Her decision to become a teacher was only uncomplicated because of the time she lived in. She talked about how most women had three options, secretary, nurse, teacher. She chose to be a teacher, regretted not being a nurse, and then didn't follow her interest to study computer science when computers emerged in the general population. She thought she was too old. She was in her 30s. The world is a better place because mom was a teacher. Hundreds of early childhood students benefited from her expertise and commitment. Despite popular perception, being an early childhood teacher is one of the most complex jobs that few people can do. I feel confident saying that to do it well means that you are called. How many people here could put together, yes, the infamous Three Piggy Opera, and accompany it on the piano while teaching children to cross their midline, learn their letters, share, say sorry and mean it, sing, count, tie shoes, hold a crayon properly, copy shapes as a precursor to letter formation, bring in commu community members to, uh, for the children to interview, and plan field trips. She had incredible people by her side to do this work. But I can guarantee you, this was an area of my mom's life that was complicated. My mom's uncomplicated parenting again created a balance while she and Bill raised three complicated daughters known on Concordia's campus as the Rachel Girls. Her parenting was faith, clear, clear rules, I love yous every day, sewing, our clothes, Barbie clothes, formal dresses, gardening, canning tomatoes, music lessons, and even making us weed the garden and work on our hook rugs while she took summer classes before she'd take us to the pool. The list is long. She even found uncomplicated ways to make a point. I remember one time complaining from my bed that I was too tired to go to church. Without pause, she said, don't you think Jesus was tired? My friend from high school and I recently discussed how consistent both our parents' parenting styles were and how we try to live up to those models. 
We joked that we had more fun trying to get around our parents' rules, often unsuccessfully, than any trouble we actually achieved. My mother also folded my sisters and my husbands into our family in an uncomplicated way. Mike, Aaron, and Dave became her sons. Those marriages brought joy with each grandchild. As much as mom loved being called wife and mother, grandmahood, I think, was what made her try to fight her disease so hard. Mom knew that each moment with her grandchildren was a gift. She delighted in our large, boisterous family gatherings, watching the cousins laugh and connect in a way that is hard to describe. She most often greeted each grandchild with, hi, honey. Last Tuesday, the hospice nurse looked at us and said, she had never seen a family like ours in a hospice space. There were 15 of us in the room at one point. After Pastor Heidi led us in a prayer service, she asked us if we wanted to share memories. The memories for a few minutes became a light that allowed us to focus on celebrating and push down the sadness for a bit. My mom's life guided us through that difficult moment. I believe my mom heard the joy in the room as we bravely choked back tears and to start playing recordings of her on phones and share memories. My niece, Abby, ended up being grateful for not cleaning off her phone messages, ever. Abby played a recording that had something to do with grandma checking in and telling her that she was drinking a frap and to call her when she could. Mike played a recording of grandma and grandpa singing to him like they did to all of us every birthday. It was like a comedy skit. With Bill, did you hang up? He didn't. The unintended recording was funnier than the intended. The loss of their grandma is going to run deep, but the uncomplicated love she gave runs deeper. And the cousin's uncomplicated love for each other will keep them together. Late last fall, mom was tired. That's how we knew something was wrong. She powered through her days, continuing to run errands, see her dear lifetime friends at water aerobics, attend grandkids' events, make home-cooked meals, read books, listen to music, email her sibs, siblings daily, and endlessly talk or text on the phone with her girls, grandkids, sisters, and friends. None of us thought that her eventual diagnosis would slow down this force of nature. It did, but only in body, not in spirit. Michelle tells the story of springing mom from the third floor rehab for a glass of wine and live music at the pub at Plymouth Place. And the pub is excellent, by the way. Michelle recalls, she took a sip of wine and said, oh, that's good. We sang You Can't Hurry Love Out Loud with a musician. She was in her wheelchair, and I was behind her with my arms around her. We were smiling so hard, singing and bopping back and forth. When the song ended, the musician looked at us, smiled, and put her hand on her heart. Lisa recalls sitting with our mom recently during one of her many blood transfusions. We listened to Natalie's last high school orchestra concert. It was extremely emotional and moving to share this with her, as she so missed attending her grandchildren's events. I will greatly miss sharing the joy of music with her. In the spaces of time that used to be filled with movement, there was a new stillness required to fight the disease. We rarely left her side. In that stillness, my sisters and I were blessed to have access to the uncomplicated wisdom that she carried from this life well lived. Lisa commented, mom demonstrated to us how to live a life of love, humility, grace, kindness, and compassion. No. 80 years of Sharon Lee Kirshner Rachel, who was called Sherry, shared by my dad, mom, big mama, grandma, or grandma, Aunt Sherry, and Mrs. Rachel is not enough. We are here to celebrate her beautiful soul. At this time, I'll invite three of Sherry's granddaughters to come forward and share words of hope from scripture. Abby Kelly and Natalie.
A reading from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you, you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Word of God, word of life. Thank you. Thanks be to God. God.
reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please join me in standing. your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ.
Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. What a gift to be gathered today with all of you, friends, as we celebrate the life of such a beautiful soul. I only began to know Sherry and Bill in these last couple of years as they began to join Kimberly and Mike on our lawn adjacent to the church here for outdoor worship. And I can still see where you were all sitting that first Sunday back to my right-hand side, and my pastor brain was doing two things. First, thinking, new faces. Remember to go say hi to those folks. And second, wow, that woman is stunning. (laughs) Cherry was beautiful, of course, but that's not actually really what I mean. What struck me about Sherry from the first, before I even actually met her, was her presence. She carried such a quiet, solid, and certain grace, even into that outdoor worship space, a grace that I feel so fortunate to have uh, encountered over these last couple of years over wine and whiskey Manhattans in your basement in conversations about theology and church practice and the life of faith, and maybe especially in the moment just over a week ago now, when Sherry was too weak to talk but still had the strength of spirit to look me directly in the eye as I anointed her precious forehead with oil, reminding her of the promises that sealed her in her baptism, those same promises that continue to hold her in love now, in her dwelling place, in God's house, prepared just for her. Who could say for sure, but... I imagine that Sherry's room in God's house is probably strung with glorious, infinite strands of Christmas lights. But Bill, mercifully, these ones never get tangled. Sherry knew the way of Jesus, a way marked by compassion and service and truth and life. And Jesus' words in the gospel reading that you all chose for today offer us a deep reassurance that Sherry is, in fact, now at home in the heart of God. But just before Jesus tells his disciples that he is going ahead to prepare a place for them, he begins with these words, don't let your hearts be troubled, which seems kind of unfair to me, honestly, because right before this don't let your hearts be troubled part, Jesus had just told his disciples, the people who were closest to him in the world, that he was about to leave them. Jesus had been the very center of their lives, and their lives had become this rich and wild adventure because of him. They had seen and experienced and become part of some incredible things, things that had changed their own lives and things that were changing the life of the world around them. So of course their hearts were troubled. Of course their hearts were afraid. They couldn't imagine their way into a future that didn't include their dearest friend and their deepest teacher. And I know that some of you can relate. It is pure grace to have had such a beloved spouse and mom, grandma and friend, aunt and sister and neighbor in your lives for all of these years. And even though We can sort of wrap our heads around the truth that Sherry is now free from the uncertainty and the suffering that marked these last many months as she waded through health challenges. Those rational thoughts don't always make much difference to our troubled hearts. Sherry mattered deeply to all of you, and grief is rough, no matter how or when it enters our lives. Frankly, a lot of this life is rough. Jesus speaks into those realities in this conversation with his disciples. They are grieving, and they know that the road ahead of them is going to be really hard. Jesus' words maybe sound a little bit trite at first blush, this, don't let your hearts be troubled. And later on in this same chapter of John's gospel, Jesus continues with more of these sayings. Peace I leave with you. He says in chapter 14, verse 27, my peace I give to you. And again, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. 
Jesus is speaking more than just platitudes here, friends. He is speaking out of his own confidence, at his own experience, that God is present and active, even when things don't make sense, even when life feels hard or unfair or unjust, even when the cloud of grief is so thick around us that we can barely even see our way through it. Even then, Jesus promises, especially then, God is at work, transforming the things of death into the things of life. I don't know what that kind of transformation might look like in your own lives, friends. Few are like most groups that gather here at Grace for a memorial service. I know that a great many of you gathered here today share a deep sense of faith that God is in fact present in our suffering. And my prayer for you today is that as you remember Sherry's life and entrust her to God's care, that your own hearts might be drawn closer to the heart of Jesus, whom you already know as the way of peace and new life. And if you are like most groups who gather here at Grace for a memorial service, I have a hunch that others of you gathered are also pretty skeptical that God exists at all, much less that God is interested in our tiny lives or that the church might be a meaningful space to wrestle with any of those things. And I want you to know that that's okay. My prayer for you today is exactly the same, that as you remember Sherry's life and sort through your grief and remember the way that she lived, the way of Jesus, that your hearts also might be drawn closer to the heart of God, who is the way of peace and new life. Because I promise you that the love of God that is big enough to surround Sherry and all of us into eternity is also big enough to hold your questions and your longings and your doubts and your griefs with tender and tireless compassion. And so may the deep peace of Jesus surround and fill your hearts in these days and weeks and months to come. Beloved people of God, amen. I'll invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing together.
invite you to join me in confessing our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. And if confessing is difficult for you today, I invite you to borrow the faith from your neighbors as we speak together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated for prayer. For the response to the prayers of intercession today, the choir will sing John Fulkening's choral refrain, The Blessing, and we are invited to repeat it and sing after each prayer petition. Let us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy. that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. God of mercy. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and assure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrows on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy. to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and life. God of mercy. us, O oh God, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and to trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. 
God of mercy. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all who believe. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us commend Sherry to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Sherry. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This concludes our worship, friends, and I will invite us at the end of our sending hymn to remain seated. I will lead the family out of the sanctuary, and they will take their leave from here in order to gather together for a private luncheon. When you hear me um, begin with the dismissal from the back of the sanctuary, that will be your invitation to stand and leave. I will invite us to stand as we sing our sending hymn number 619.
us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.